Um, welcome to the first Noisy Thinking of 2018. It's been um, a big week. We've had Valentine's Day, Pancake Day, but this is the biggest of the week, I reckon. Um, so thank you for packing it out. Um, it's awesome to see you here. And it's my first Noisy Thinking as chair of the APG. My name is Matt Tanter. I'm CSO of Grey London. And I am a combination of honoured, excited, and mildly petrified to be chair for the next two years of the APG, because it is an incredible organisation that I've been a part of and loved for many, many years. So to be sitting um, as part of the committee and the helm is, is awesome. We had a first committee meeting of the new lot uh, yesterday, a proper rabble-rousing lot it was, trying to keep Kevin Chester shut up was, a, was, a, was, a, was, a, was an interesting thing. Um, and if you know anything about the APG, then you'll know that we actually don't run it. Sarah Newman and her incredible team run the APG, who do an awesome job and have done for several years. So we were trying to keep up with her mainly. But critically, the APG is, is a community. So I would say to all of you, um, as open and as collaborative as we can be, I'd love to hear from as many of you as possible, really, ideas, thoughts, get involved. My inbox and my door is always open, so please do shout. I hope to get to know a lot of you over the next couple of years. We we'll start by saying thank you to Google, uh, if Will's here and the rest of the crew, um, for their ongoing partnership and sponsorship. It's amazing, and we get to have noisy thinking in this wonderful environment. Um, with great facilities and great refreshments. So, and also, should stay, it's up, up, um, up on, the, on the screens. We're partnering again this year with YouTube for the YouTube Brand Works Effectiveness um, Awards. So if you do have a case study, you think you might have a case study, deadline is 9th of March, I believe. And if you have any questions, Sarah or Will, I believe, will be around this evening to, uh, to ask. So um, that's, that's it to start with. On to the theme, the art of persuasion, how do you get your idea over the line? I think you can see by the fact it's pretty packed that it certainly caught the imagination of everyone at the start of the year. And Sarah has used her art of persuasion to persuade four incredible people to come and persuade you that their art of persuasion is what you need to persuade clients to persuade consumers with your idea. So we've got meta levels, meta levels of persuasion going on this evening. Um, it's also no surprise that um, this theme is interesting to me. We no doubt are operating in times when creativity of thought, of idea, and of output has never been more needed to move the game forward. But equally, the burden of proof placed upon us to predict and prove the effectiveness of our thinking is higher than ever. Concurrently, we've got uncertain economic times, more competition, and just at the point when clients should be taking bigger risks, they're more nervous and reluctant to do so than ever before. So the ability to persuade our clients um, is, is critical. Um, what I think is really interesting is you've, we've all been in a situation where you come bounding into a room full of passion. You know you've got an idea that's going to change the world, and with all your guile and artistry, you present and, uh, and, and hand over to the client only to be met with stony faced silence and an opposing point of view. And then we do what our agency and industry tells us to do, which is hold strong onto our ideas and reassert our passion and belief in what we, what we have. Again, rather than persuading clients, we end up maybe doing quite the opposite. And I'm sure we've all heard of the, the backfire effect in the last couple of years with Trump and with Brexit. It's the notion that we as humans are wired to hold what we believe to be true close to us. It's self-preservation. We ignore what goes against it, and we hold true and close what reinforces and confirms our opinion. And I find that fascinating because as you push and push forward our ideas with greater and greater passion, quite the opposite from persuasion happens. We create a sort of entrenchment in the opposing view rather than uh, a manipulation in their belief and behavior. And what that says to me is we spend all of our lives and days as planners and strategists empathizing with consumers, putting ourselves in their shoes, using our thoughts, our, our guile, and our understanding to manipulate and change their behavior in brilliant ways. But do we expend the same energy to our clients? Do we walk in their shoes? Do we understand their hopes, their fears, their motivations, and work with them to truly get to ideas that they themselves think they have created and we have simply been a partner in? And that's why I think it's truly, really interesting today is to understand empathy from, from that point of view. So that's what the four speakers tonight will, will, will help us uh, go through. In a, a sense of persuasion, they said last year that experts are dead, but we've got four of them right here. So, um, so that's great. First up is Martin Beverly, Executive Strategy Director at Adam and Eve DDB, winner of two golds at APGs in the last two awards. So he's persuaded us, me included, that his ideas are brilliant. So it should be a good tonight. Uh, he's worked on some of the best creative campaigns on John Lewis, Honda, and Three in recent years. After Martin, we're joined by Marie Oldham, who is the CSO at VCCP Media, uh, putting media thinking at the heart of an ad agency, which I believe is a fascinating perspective. Um, she's also been a client of the BBC, um, a partner of Habits Media, and run her own consultancy, Fresh Eyes. So a wealth of brilliant experience that hopefully will benefit from uh, this evening. Third up, Laura Jordan Burnback, uh, who is CCO at Mr. President, and I'm told calls herself Mrs. President, which is um, no doubt she's allowed to do so, as also she is president of the DNAD and co-founder of the brilliant She Says 
an organization which encourages women to take up creative digital careers. Also, head of the art and head of design group at creative, uh, as a creative director at LBI, so know a thing or two about behavioral science, and uh, has got a whole page to herself this week in the A-list. I've been, I've, someone's put there, so fantastic, well done. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, the man needs no introduction, Jim Carroll. Um, he describes himself as a long-serving strategist and former chairman of BBH. Um, I think we all um, have benefited massively from Jim's wisdom and his blogs and his posts. He writes absolutely beautifully, and hopefully tonight will bring us some words of wisdom in, in, in his presentation. Having made incredible work for Levi's, Axe, Lynx, um, it should be a good and great night. And please, it is called Noisy Thinking, which means the noise won't just be going that way. We'd like some questions and some thoughts from you guys, and if you don't have any, I might prompt and push uh, some people to ask some questions at the end, so that'd be great. But before we get to the speakers and to Martin, should also thank uh, Flamingo who have been a fantastic sponsor of Noisy Thinking today and continue to be so. So brilliant brand and Insight Global um, Consultancy. So this is me on a daily basis. Fairly quiet and unassuming. This is my new business <laughs> photo. Um, but the guys at the APG said, don't be you. We need you to be more noisy and provocative. And, I, and this really isn't me getting the noisy, it's my mic. Um, and I had to really try for this photo. But I'm going to try and be a bit provocative-ish. Um, so the topic is the art of persuasion. Uh, really, I'm just going to talk about making ideas happen. Um, and this became really important to me very early on. I used to work with a guy called Tiago de Marais, who is absolutely wonderful. This is his illustration. That's him on the right. And he had a book on his desk, which was underneath his map, called Killed Ideas. And it was volume two. And when stuff died, he would write in his book. And I thought, shit, it's volume two. Um, and it's just really important to make ideas happen, ultimately. It's a really important topic. Because ideas don't exist until you make them happen. So there's lots of talk in this industry. I'm going to do some talking. Um, but really, until things happen, th there's just nothing at all. Um, so hey, planners, because there's a lot of you in the room, like PowerPoint doesn't really count. I know there's an irony I'm presenting on PowerPoint. <laughs> but it doesn't really count. You have to influence people. You have to make stuff happen. And I've got 10 tricks for making ideas happen. And I'm going to do it in about eight minutes. Um, one small caveat, I like this uh, quote from Ricky Gervais, the best advice I've ever received is no one else knows what they're doing either. I don't really. These are all just slightly bullshit things that might help. Uh, but see what you think. Uh, the first trick is make it everyone. So Bridget, who works at uh, AMV, who I worked for for five years, is wonderful. And she said, uh, we embrace what we create. So when you feel part of something, you put your heart into it. And the more you can make it feel like everyone's idea, the better. So. Rather than going around the agency going, I've had an idea, uh, start talking about we've had a thing and try and make everyone feel like it's theirs. It's really important that like, lots of people try to claim ideas in agencies, and that is the wrong thing to do in my experience. So start thinking about we. Uh, and get everyone to do their thing. So increasingly, the ideas that we're trying to create are now about a gang of people coming around it with specialisms. And the more you can make them feel like they are doing their bit to make it better, you will, get, you will be on to something. Uh, we recently did a campaign for FIFA. Uh, where we made a move in the game with Cristiano Ronaldo, which was a virtual move, but it influenced the real world. And lots and lots of people came into contact with that to make it happen. Social media, the design of the game, everything, the TV ad. But there were lots of bits to it, even the cultural stuff with Adidas that we did. But ultimately, it got to the end of that campaign, and my boss, uh, DG, said, oh, whose idea was it? And I was like, everyone's. Like, it was everyone's. There were 30 people who worked on it. Second uh, trick is nail the problem, especially you planners in the room. Um, if you agree objectives up front, idea judging becomes more objective. If you can start to then, rather than have fanciful, indulgent, creative ideas that look like you're trying, sort of disappearing up your own arse, suddenly they become lateral solutions to a shared problem, and then it becomes harder to argue with them. Um, an example of that recently that I worked on was Marmite. So we said it was all about trial. Like, don't forget anything else. This is about getting people to try Marmite, even if they've tried it in the past, get them to pick it up again. Uh, and more specifically, we got to this, get parents who hate Marmite to still get their kids to try it for breakfast. So when we presented the Marmite gene test kit, they went, actually, that's not that mad, because it will get people around the breakfast table talking about whether they love Marmite. And if they love it, their kids hate it. And so right, if we'd just gone with that off the bat, I think they probably wouldn't have bought it. But it was baked into the problem. Third thing is beat the system. So. Lots of your clients will have to do research. They will just have to as part of their organizations. But don't hate them for doing that. Hate the game. Hate the research game. I know Flamingo are here, so I, I, 
<laughs> David Burroughs is looking at me a bit weird. Uh, but here's, here's the thing that I wanted to just explain about it. So take the test, if there's a quant test, and know exactly how it works. Because once you actually take that test, you'll realize how to critique it, but also how to make your stimulus work better. Um, bias the stimulus. Uh, if you've got qual groups, make sure the music's good, make sure the boards are good, kind of make the reference as good as it can possibly be. I once got an ad through research by saying it would be a bit like a Nike ad. And it, and it and got away with it. Because sometimes you can cheat it, um, which I know is not the right thing to do, but sometimes you have to to get an idea through. Um, beware false positives. So it's easy to do research and go, well, it did quite well. People kind of liked it. But sometimes that's not good. Um, actually, sometimes saying we want something a bit more divisive. So going into this research, some people aren't going to really like it, but some people will really love it. Actually, my prep clients in the right way, in the same way as pre-warn them against negatives. So maybe it's uh, a new campaign for a brand, so maybe the branding won't be quite so good. Or maybe there's no new news, so persuasion might not be so good. All of those things, talk to them about it in advance, because then they're prepped as to why it might not be quite where it needs to be. Um, also influence the debrief. The more you can talk to research agencies and frame the same data in slightly different ways or create different competitive sets, the better. Uh, and avoid the middle. So this is something which Les and Sarah, Adam and Eve talk about a lot, which is uh, research at the beginning to get lovely cultural insight and territory and richness and kind of make sure you've got the right kind of insights. Then don't really do anything in the middle where you're trying to draw emotions. Research once it's made at the end and see its impact in the real world. The more you can avoid the middle, the better. And actually, lots of our best clients don't research in the middle at all. John Lewis do not do that. They only do right at the beginning and right at the end. Um, Four, be brutally honest. Um, I think sometimes with clients, it's OK to say it's not good enough and just be really, really honest about it. Because um, sometimes arguments can be a good thing. I once was asked to leave the room by a client for being too argumentative about why I thought the work was right. And they literally asked me to leave the room. But four years later, they're now a client, Adam and Eve, because they respected the fact that I wanted to protect the work. And you know, I think that stands you in good stead. because. Honesty builds trust. If you can be, rather than trying to ultimately sell work you don't believe in, because we've all done that, where you go into a room and you kind of, you sort of know it's not quite where it needs to be. And the more you do that, it slightly chips away at your soul, um, one. But also clients then don't trust you. Whereas if you say it's not good enough, then ultimately I think you end up getting to better work. So when I worked at Wyden and Kennedy, we moved a meeting back three times. And Honda were like, what the fuck? We've got, we need to launch a campaign in November. Why are you moving this meeting? What is the problem? And we just said, we don't think we've got anything good enough yet. And what happened was when we walked into the room, they knew that we did. They knew we had one thing, and they, they knew that we all believed in it, and they bought it instantly. Five, prey on the weak. So it's much easier to get uh, work through clients that really need to change something. Um, so where it's kind of riskier to do nothing than to take a risk. Now, that's not always the case, but particularly with challenger brands, they're more up for stuff, generally. So when I worked on three, we went to them and said, would it be bonkers to do free roaming? And they sort of said, yeah, kind of bonkers, but actually, the EU might change the law, and it would cost O2 250 million. It wouldn't cost us that much, because we don't have that many customers anyway. And so you start, they start to go, yeah, do you know what? Let's, let's go for it. And, and that's the kind of that's the way to sort of get to clients and, and get them to really buy the best stuff. Um, even a client that's doing really well, this is a classic narrative I've nicked from Michael Lee, but he is a friend of mine, so he won't mind. Um, everything's been going really well, kind of stability. That's where you can flatter a client. Then there's a change in worlds. So there's a threat. There's jeopardy. There's kind of something which actually means you're under threat. Luckily, we've got something really clever that's going to reframe things. And then look at this creative idea. It's going to make it amazing. So you manage to go start high, then threat then kind of redemption, and then something brilliant. And the more you can tell that story, even with clients who are doing well, the more likely you are to sell stuff, I think. Six is find your charisma. This is like a really, really bad end line. And I read the BBH thing about lines that say find your, uh, but it's not an end line. It's just me trying to describe what this is. Um, ultimately, it might be you. You might be the reason they're not buying the idea. Um, you need to find what is going to appeal to them about yourself. You've got to sort of be more likable. They're buying you, not just your ideas. Um, and I'm glad Jim's here because I read something on his blog that I really liked, which is generally what happens in appraisals, particularly early in your career, is people tell you to be someone else. They go, well, you're not analytical enough, or do you know what? You don't get excited enough, or you need to think things through more, or you get a bit impassioned. And actually, I just think 
the older I've got, I read the blog and I totally agree that you should just accentuate your natural positives. If you get really excited, be really excited. If you're quiet and analytical and don't want to say much, don't say much, just say the most important thing in the room. Um, this is, Dave Trott said this, I really like it, energy beats talent. Generally, I just go around the agency getting excited about stuff and it sort of seems to work for me because the more you get excited, everyone else kind of gets excited. Um, and optimism is really infectious. So if you go in sort of bouncing and smiling, people go, they've, they've got to have something good. Like Craig Inglis, John Lewis, he always says, <laughs> he said the other day, and now we have to watch ourselves. I know when you've got something good because of the way you walk in the room. It's like, oh, shit. But like, think, just think about that when you walk in, like you make that impression. Um, because it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. So it's tone and it's body language and all of that comes across. Also make it personal. I, probably everyone's seen this Mad Men scene. By making it a personal story, suddenly everyone wants to listen. We're human beings. The more you can make it personal, the better in terms of getting an idea sold. And if you're the planner, quite a good role to adopt is just be the one who calmly explains why it would work at the end, often. Because once you get emotional feels plus rational reassurance when you're presenting an idea. You've sort of got both sides of the coin. You're doing system one, system two. That, mo that works for the majority of clients generally. Seven is mirror their personality. So this is something which is an Adam and Eve training course. You've basically got four types of people you've got. The, the way to think about this is if um, your client missed their flight, would they be analytical and work out when the next flight is, how long it would take them to get to another airport, whether they can change somewhere else, all of those things and basically work through all the analytics. Would they march up and go, hey, I've got an Amex card and you just get me on the next flight and be a kind of driver? Would they sort of get really upset or cry about it or get kind of just really emotional? Or would they just worry what everyone else is going to think? And once you begin to think about where people are and you can then mirror them, you're far more likely to create a connection because there is this unconscious bias around people liking people who are like them. It just happens in life. It's generally why people just hire people a bit like themselves, unfortunately. Um, and so if you can mirror people, that tends to work really well. This is Ian Pearman. I used to work with him. He was unbelievable at walking into a room and he would go from, all right, fella, and just be really kind of funny to, I've got a Harvard MBA and I'm very analytical. And he would do both. And it was a very natural thing but it was wonderfully effective at creating connections with clients almost instantly. And I'd go, it's not him, but it, it would work. He would just kind of work the room really brilliantly. Um, number eight is walking their shoes. Actually, Matt briefly touched on this. Just a few questions to think of. So what would get your client a promotion? Most of them are looking to leave in the next one to three years or feel like they need a promotion. So what would get them one? What might get them the new job? What would ultimately impress their boss. That's what most clients are trying to do. That's what we're all really trying to do. Um, so try and think about it in those terms, like what would, what would sort of get them that extra pay rise or extra promotion? Um, what would show they get the rhetoric? So if you're going into Unilever and you're not talking about purpose, you're unlikely to get anywhere. If you're going into Mars and you're not talking about Byron Sharp and memory structures and fame, you're unlikely to get anywhere. You've just got to face into these things and frame your idea in the right way because your clients will be thinking about that all the time. Number nine is get real. Um, this was actually Jess, who's my work wife, gave me this one. Um, so I don't want to take too much credit, but maybe it's not one of the best. I don't know. We'll see. Um, this was about show and tell. So we often do telling and we tell a story, but actually just showing and demonstrating things can be really powerful. So go one step further and make it feel possible. One small example with Skittles. We mocked up that pack and took it in, and it became a prop. And the client went, can I take that? and just so I can show my boss. And it just made them think, actually, this could be on the shelves. It's not as impossible as it seems. Um, another thing is prototypes they can play with, increasing with the ideas we make. The more we can make them happen and give clients a thing. That's how we sold Honda Type R. We actually mocked it up so they could type R on the keyboard. But we had um, Ryan Gosling in Drive and then some kind of generic like Middle England thing. And the client was going, mm, 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 mm. and then we were like, now imagine that they're driving. He was sold, and he said, can I have that to just go and show my boss? It's just making it really practical. And then number 10 is simple, stealable summaries. So you will soon realize, if you haven't already, that no one can really remember what happened in the meeting apart from the biscuits. Like You'll get to the end, and you'll be like, what was that all about? And so the more you can just give clients the killer pitch on a page, the one chart that they can literally take and pass on, the better. Often even better if it's a film, a one minute film that just goes, here's the challenge, so here's what we've done, and here's the idea, and isn't it exciting? So they can literally just press play. 
We did that recently with a client, and the next week it was at a global conference. We're like, oh, that's sold then. And if we hadn't made the film, probably wouldn't have got that far. Because um, most of the selling actually generally happens afterwards to their boss and their boss's boss. And the more you can give people a very simple tool to do that, the better. And you can avoid corporate Chinese whispers where the idea becomes something else and then comes back to you. If you've written it very simply, or it's a film, they can't change the film. Uh, and then I saw this, I think Amelia Turod retweeted it, and I really liked it. Uh, there are two types of smart people in the world, people who make simple things complicated and people who make complicated things simple. And if you're a planner in the room, in fact, if you're generally anyone in the room, um, be this guy. And the more you can do that at the end and give that simple summary, the better. They will nick that, trust me, and they will keep repeating it. So be that guy. And with that in mind, I've got my 10 things. So make it everyone's, nail the problem, beat the system research-wise, but play nicely with Flamingo. Um, Four, be brutally honest. Five, prey on the weak. Six, find your charisma. Seven, mirror their personality. Eight, walk in their selfish shoes. Nine, get real. And 10, write simple, stealable summaries. And that's me done in about 10 minutes. Well, that is just your worst nightmare to have to have to follow Martin. And my second worst nightmare is actually to be asked to be presenter and APG uh, get together. Because I thought, what is this? this sort of, some sort of diversity thing? You know, do they need more women? Or do they need more media people to make it feel a bit more encompassing? But when I thought about it, I thought, you know, every single brief I get says, the client sends us back, give us amazing cut through ideas never been done before, communications plans full of innovation and impact. And that's what we're all being asked for every single day. So I thought maybe I might have a couple of thoughts on that. Martin got 10, I think I've got about five. Um, but I thought, okay, I've got a couple of thoughts. It might, be, it might be a bit of help and let's see how it goes. So on my way home on the train one evening, I thought, all right, I better get started on this, this um, persuasion presentation. And as you do, you Google it. And uh, apart from some very boring business books on the art of persuasion, you get hundreds of covers of persuasion. I've been a bit of a bookworm. I flicked through them for hours as opposed to starting on my presentation. But I thought, actually, it, they really do show you. This is what we sometimes think that persuasion is. Two people facing in opposite directions, and it's your job to sort of fight them into your corner or to win. And actually, I don't think that's true when we're going into clients. It's not a negative where you're trying to <laughs> persuade them of your way. They actually do want good ideas, because going back to Martin's point, they want to be promoted, they want to get their bonuses, they want to make their sales. So I think they're willing you to want to, to bring them a good idea. So I think take advantage of that. So the first thing is, I think remember that the client does want you to come in with something really good. So let's think of it not as a battle, but taking going on a journey together. But we're going to use loads of AMV sort of uh, cues tonight. Craig Morsley told me something really brilliant, which is always start every single presentation by telling the client how wonderful they are. So this is Esther being um, fated by all and sundry trying to sell to her. And he told me that in his pitch, his first few charts are, you are amazing. And so you tell the client, your brand is brilliant. Thank you so much for the brief. So I always thank clients for giving us the brief. And, you know, thank us for giving it. It's a great problem. It's really kept our brains ticking over for weeks. So a bit of flattery up front. And actually, it's true. We are very lucky. And we have to remember is that, you know, the clients worked really hard to give you the brief. So I think responding to them first of all and saying, thank you, this has been brilliant, sets you in a really good position, I think. However, at the end of the day, they do also want to feel in charge. So once you've done the setting them up and telling them how fantastic you are, then it's over to you. So you then have to become Balthasar here. You've got to land a surprise. So my view is that you always have to land a surprise in the first 10 or 15 minutes of meeting. It's your chance to add value. You now have to bring to the table something they didn't know. Genuine insight, genuine step forward that helps them crack the problem that they've been torturing themselves with for months or weeks or years, whatever. This is your insight moment. You know, why choosing a holiday is, is all about being a great parent. It's actually because you want to be the best mum in the whole world. That's what you're doing when you're sitting there at night looking at, you know, how you can get a bargain, how you can get a deal, how you can get your kids away for the summer holidays. It's nothing to do with price or how many hours it is and all the things people feed you back sometimes in focus groups. It's, I want to be seen to be the best mum in the world. And that's what you have to lead your client into that world and take them on a journey that they couldn't get from any other team in their company. I always think that's where we add value. 
as a media person, I've spent years explaining why 13 million people want to watch a baking program. And again, a, a woman, actually, the, the X Factor before that, a woman in Watford, when I worked on National Lottery, said to me something really insightful, that the reason her family watched The X Factor, even though we sort of hate ourselves for it, that she felt like a good mum, because her teenagers, her sons, her daughters, her 11-year-old, were all in the same room on a Saturday night. She didn't care what she had to watch. But if your kids are on the same sofa as you, that makes you very happy. So we have to remember that sometimes they're deeply psychological things that pull people together. And that's what we can bring to our clients. So I think surprising your clients, you're 50% on the way to selling your idea in if you've landed that. And really, what it does is that's your touchstone, I think, for three months down the line when it starts to wobble. That insight is what you say to your client, remember, remember we're digging deep for those mums or we're digging deep for those families in Britain. If you can land that insight, if that's the value you brought to the table, it allows you to pull them back in when, the, when everybody wavers, when the CEO doesn't quite like it. The next most important thing I think about your big idea, and Martin said it a couple of times, is keep it simple. You know, it might be beautiful, might have some great complexity to it, but we all know what it is. It should look really simple. It shouldn't have a spaghetti junction chart in it. It shouldn't have language that they won't remember when they take it up to their boss and go, I can't quite remember what they meant by that acronym or that's some amazing media or ad speak. You know, ethnographics and things like that. Great for us, but when you hand it over to the client, hand it over in its most beautiful, simple form, whether that's a media plan or a vision for doing something really exciting or a creative idea, I think you land your insight you land your idea and you hand it to them in a beautiful, simple format because they have to sell it on, exactly as you said. You think, could they stand this? Could they stand in a room and sell this on in a month's time when they haven't seen the agency for ages? That's what we've got to give them. And this is something that I learned a long, long time ago. A client who I've become great friends with told me that most ideas fail if you pass on too much of a burden to them to get work done. So don't sell them something that means that somebody in their building has to build a website, somebody in their building has to do a new app, somebody in their building has to do, create a new chocolate line in terms of NPD. You have to do the work. You sell them the idea and you say, don't worry, we'll build the website. Or you say, you already turn up and go, there's the app, it's already done. Because you give them an idea that means that they have to get new resource. Most clients are under-resourced, they're under-budgeted. Don't give them loads of work to do. So have a look at your idea and think, is this causing us work? It's fine, we get paid for it. If it's causing the client work, it will flounder and die as soon as you walk away out of the building. I genuinely believe that the more work you give the client team to do, the more likelihood there is of your work failing. There's a hundred reasons not to do everything, and you have to make sure that you don't give the client any reasons not to. So at the end of the day, as Martin said, I had to raid it from VCCP. Keep it as simple as you can. Remember five or six things. Clients want good ideas. Go into the room smiling and positive. They want you to succeed. Your body language will share that with them. It is a shared journey that you want to take them on, but there's only one boss, and that's them. So you make them feel and believe it is their idea. They're taking it forward on the journey. You have to add value. You have to give them an insight that solves the problem. And that's our job, is to give them the solution, open the door, but that becomes the touchstone that you keep going back to. The best strategies have a beautiful simplicity in the language we provide our clients, a really simple story that they can tell anybody and the actions we're asking them to do. The client is the boss. You do the work. Always remember that when you're putting the idea forward. And I think the one last thing that I always teach people when we're training people, is that tenacity, I think, is 50% of our job. So when you sell it in and you walk out of the room, the job's only begun. You need to call the client next day, ask them any, any issues, any hurdles they can see. If it's floundering, you go back in and see where the problem was. You support your team when it's floundering. I always think that's where our real job is. Tenacity is what we're really good at. And that's it for me.
right. Um, all of those things, yes. <laughs> We're getting like a smaller and smaller, uh, smaller and smaller funnel of uh, kind of things to uh, to share with you. But um, those those two uh, presentations have been great. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I think about when I think about persuasion. Um, as a creative person, I'm going to sort of delve into a couple of pieces of work that I've done in the last couple of years that have been particularly difficult, I guess, to persuade the clients to go through with, um, and just talk about how we got there. So uh, first thing I would say, it's all down to relationships. Actually, the best thing about persuasion is if you have a really great relationship, it shouldn't be about persuasion at all. It should be about a shared goal. It should be about kind of focusing on that amazing piece of insight that means that everyone is pulling behind it. And actually, you can go so far, sell much braver work, do much more exciting things if you've got that relationship and you've got that understanding and the trust and you've developed that up front. So I'd say that is like number one, the one goal of kind of any person working in this industry is be your clients, like mate, confidant, close enough to be able to argue with them, close enough to be able to say like you're talking a load of bollocks, close enough for them to be able to say your piece of work is boring. You know, that relationship is absolutely, absolutely the most important thing. Um, but I've got kind of three key points, I guess, that I wanted to talk about in terms of three pieces of work. And the first one is don't be afraid of the right answer. So very often we get given a brief and the brief might have a particular shape to it or it might have a, I don't know, sort of a particular thing that the client wants to achieve. Spend that time as planners to kind of pull that away and actually understand what the real issue behind the brand is. As you said, it might not be price. It might be actually wanting to feel like a really great mom when you go on holiday. But make sure that you're finding that right answer and make sure that you stick with it. Um, the piece of work that I'm going to show, actually, it's a work that I did for, that we did for Bacardi. <clears throat> it's a couple of years old. Um, but it's honestly the, I guess, the bravest piece of work we've ever done, the most challenging piece of work personally that I've ever done. Um, and the brief from the client is, we're throwing a party in the Bermuda Triangle um, at Halloween, we've spent eight million pounds on it. We've got Kendrick Lamar, Ellie Goulding, and Calvin Harris playing over three nights. Brilliant idea. We're going to invite like 2,000 influencers to come along because we figure with 2,000 influencers, you'll be able to get this amazing global reach for the brand. Can you come and do the social media and uh, you know interview the influencers and do all that kind of stuff? We could have said yes. It was like quite a nice gig. Get to go to Bermuda, etc. <clears throat> But really, when we sort of pulled back and thought about things from an audience perspective, so it's for Bacardi. Bacardi is drunk by like middle American young men who are never, ever, ever going to be cool enough to go to a party like this. And like, what is worse than watching a whole bunch of shit in your feeds about a party that you're not cool enough to go to? So we pulled our client aside, and luckily we built that relationship first. And we said, you know, yes, we can go, and yes, we can interview people, and yes, we can do all of this stuff, fine. We really honestly don't think it's the right way to go about it. We need to find someone that can speak from our audience's point of view. <clears throat> so we found an amazing guy called Marcus Haney. He's a famous festival gate crasher. He's broken into Glastonbury and the Emmys and the Grammys and um, Coachella. And he does it like with quite a lot of style. And he has a whole bunch of friends who break in with him, one of whom's in a wheelchair and like kind of gets him under the fence and what have you, you know, in costumes and this and that. And he just made a movie for MTV. And we, in the budget, um, they had one tweet from Ellie Goulding. So we, we were able to craft a tweet from Ellie Goulding for the entire thing. And we thought rather than getting her to tweet about, isn't this party cool? What if we get her to challenge him to break into this festival? Um, this meant kind of giving away creative control. He's an artist. He had to do this properly. It meant no one on the island was notified. There was the Puerto Rican army guarding this island because of all the celebs. No one was allowed to know. Um, only it was our client and the agency and Marcus knew what was happening. Ellie sent the tweet out, and I'll play you a little bit of the film to show you what happened. If you could play the film. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
As you can see, he turned up dressed as her. Um, his best friend was dressed as her boyfriend at the time, Dougie. Um, they broke in. The, the story is amazing, but what was more amazing is, you know, that could have been a series of like really boring social posts. And yes, we had to do some of those on the side. But what we ended up with was a 24-minute ready-to-air on MTV film to sell back to MTV in the States. The client, you know, basically allowed us to do this was still so nervous that he actually they don't own any of the rights to that it's that like co-owned by mr president and marcus haney because it was really you know it's quite a scary thing to figure out or to to try to figure out kind of what might happen so you know we had um at one point he was planning to jump out of a plane with his friend in the wheelchair and land on this beach and there were like two thousand basically drunk famous people on this beach and we were trying to tell him Absolutely, he couldn't do it. And he was basically, you know, an American style going like, fuck you, I'm going to do whatever you want. And so we were having to write NDAs like on the beat. And that's the other thing, actually, about taking pressure off your client. You know, we kind of protected him from all of this stuff that was going on. We protected him from the fact that we got delivered 68 hours of footage and we had to edit it all ourselves. You know, we protected him from, uh, you know, all the kind of, sort of the legal shit that uh, could have happened. Um, and that, you know, that resulted in a really great piece of work. So um, for, for that, I would say, you know, find the right problem. The right problem is that those young guys are never going to be excited by what the client has briefed us. So let's do the thing that will really get them excited. I can see someone that worked on it at the back there. Hey. Um, the next one is when you reach an impasse, reach for a shared uh, voice or voices for validation. Don't accept no. So... I'm going to show you a piece of work which has been incredibly, incredibly, incredibly successful. Um, it's got amazing results. Creatively, it's been incredible for us um, and for the client. But it has been a real struggle. And the real struggle is along something as simple as this line. To come out for LGBT, it's the Stonewall campaign. It's their first campaign in 10 years. It came out uh, towards the end of last year. This took us so many rounds of testing um, and it took us probably about eight months to get to and the reason it took us eight months to get to is this campaign is about activating the broad population the allies the people that are broadly supportive of lgbt rights and don't do anything it's not to activate or uh, put your arms around the lgbt community as such now the really interesting thing <clears throat> You know, obviously, the Stonewall are 180 people working in the organization, all of whom have had very personal experiences and sometimes traumatic experiences of being LGBT. The words come out for someone that is struggling or isn't able to come out or has had a terrible experience are very, very provocative. And so we knew through all the work that we'd done, all the testing we'd done, all the rigor we'd done, all the millions of ideas that we've done, that this was the thing that was going to mobilize allies it was understandable it's understandable it's about lgbt issues you really understand what it is that you're asking someone to do but the client absolutely just could not see that that was the case and was incredibly nervous about everything about you know even things like the full stop at the end here which we spent weeks having a discussion over the full stop but we really knew it was the right thing um, and when we couldn't come to a decision or we, we, we had an impasse and they kept on saying we will not do this, but like we won't buy this piece of work, you have to go again. We just kept on presenting it, but we presented it with different points of view. So we did more testing and we listened to more people and we actually got some really interesting kind of third party 
people from outside of the community to come in and be our advocates. You know, say, this is the audience, this is the audience we've agreed on, this is what's going to move them, and you need to listen to them because you can't listen to us, and we're, no, you know, we're not going to get anywhere otherwise. And what's, what it's turned into is a really very powerful campaign. And actually, the power of the line has been great, a great piece of persuasion in itself. So um, one of the things that was very key to us was to talk to marginalized groups or groups that you wouldn't normally expect to support LGBT issues. So people like the army. That's, um, I always want to call him Colonel Sanders, but his name's General Sanders. He's the third most uh, powerful, uh, like, uh, powerful uh, man in the uh, uh, UK army um, with one of his gay sergeants. You know, he donated his time. We were able to persuade him to come down and give his time because of that power of the idea. Um, this is Ryan. He is the first openly gay FA ref, so we actually helped him come out. But, you know, to be able to get these people down and actually contributing and, and to the campaign has, was, has been really phenomenal. I'm going to play you the film, and the amazing thing about the film is everyone there has contributed. Like, we, I guess as an agency, created this film out of nothing. So. Um, we worked with a, a production company called Pretty Bird, who are amazing. They donated all their time, all their equipment, their director for free. The Mill did all the post-production for free. Wave gave us all the music for free. Um, the entire piece of work was made for absolutely no money because of the power of the idea. And uh, you know, I guess that's what I wanted to say about the persuasion. If you've got a really strong idea, you can bring people along with you. If you could play the video. <laughs> So that for them was a really big deal. You know, it's a nice piece of film, but it's a really big deal for them. Uh, thirdly, lastly, um, once you've got uh, like a big connected idea, everything becomes a lot easier. I think, as, as you said, you know, it means that you can make sense of kind of the crazy things that you might, um, you might kind of suggest if you've got a really, really clear, really insightful, interesting proposition. So we work for Crown Estates. Um, and actually, the piece of work we're doing at the moment is placemaking St. James. So that is building um, a world for St. James in a way that doesn't exist at the moment. So you know what Mayfair stands, like, stands for. You know what Covent Gun stands for. Probably King's Cross now, because I've been doing a lot of placemaking. You understand what King's Cross is about. St. James, you can't even figure out where the borders are. It doesn't really mean anything. And so when they are going to prospective shops, when they're going to retailers, when they're going to prospective kind of business owners or, or you know, residential folk, um, they need to have something to stand for. And so we developed a really great, strong proposition for them called one of a kind. Now, one of a kind is something that operates entirely through their business. So it means that now when they speak to retailers, say, I don't know, um, uh, next wanted to come into St. James, they go, well, you could have a next, but it has to be a one of a kind next. So how are you going to make that retailer one of a kind? You've got Ollie and Steen there. Ollie and Steen there do different things to all the other Ollie and Steens because it's one of a kind. And that's allowed us some really interesting creative freedom, um, which has uh, ended up most recently, actually. We do uh, their magazine, their local magazine called The Correspondent. And for the one of a kind uh, last month, we developed a one of a kind fragrance with Floris. The fragrance is um, developed from all the smells around St. James. So you've got the amazing kind of shoe shops, and you've got the tea shops, and you've got you know all this, the tailors and the, the kind of the dirty streets and the gentlemen's club and the tobacco. And you know actually to be able to create that scent and then spray it across the magazines is lovely. We wouldn't have been able to get there had we not had a really 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 strong proposition that was stretchy enough to allow us to play. So finally, I guess with great creativity comes great responsibility. Those relationships are key. You can be massively exciting and creative, but you also have the responsibility for your client's business. Um, and if you can prove to them that you put their business first, it's not about awards and it's not about you know, frivolity. It's about actually delivering them business value then uh, creativity flourishes and that relationship flourishes. So um, yeah, thank you very much.
Hello. Um, nice to be here. Um, thank you, Laura. Um, five powers of persuasion. Um, and, and, and reassuringly, I think many of the themes that we've already had will be played out in my, uh, my brief talk. Um, I used to share an office with a young planner in the days of shared offices. And um, uh, you know when you share an office or a workspace with someone, you, you listen to their problems. You listen to them talk about their work problem. And you think, that's interesting. They're having a bit of an argument about something. What do I think? What do I think about this problem? And the interesting thing was, I used to listen to this young planner's arguments with her account director. And she was always right, in my opinion. She was a super brainy girl, super brainy. And she was always right, and she always lost. And the account director poo-pooed it and said, I don't think that's right. I don't think we're going to go with that. The client won't like that. And it was a curse. She was cursed, the poor woman, because she was always right, but she always lost. And uh, I, I, I took her to one side, and I said, you know, the awful thing is in our business, it's not enough to be right. And when you're brainy, a lot of planners are very brainy, they get to the right answers, but they don't understand that get, being right is cheap. We are in the persuasion business, and we need to persuade first our colleagues, then the creative department, then our clients, and then ultimately consumers. And that is the skill we need. Brains are to a penny. <laughs> Smart people are all over the place. But persuasion is a precious skill. And the sad thing about my colleague was she was Cassandra, gifted with the skill of prophecy, but cursed never to be believed. So uh, I'm going to go through the five skills. And um, uh, I'll do them nice and quickly. Uh, and, and I'll start with the skill that um, actually has come up all the way through this evening, which is uh, the skill of empathy, because I think the reason it comes up so much is that we always start when we're selling something, uh, thinking about us or thinking about what we're selling. Uh, whereas any great sell, any great persuasion, must begin, even if you don't want it to, must begin in understanding them, the client. And, um, I guess, as we say, that's putting ourselves in the client's shoes. Or as um, Chaka Khan said, Chaka Khan, uh, I feel for you. That's a middle-aged joke from uh, music. Um, and it, this is info. This is almost exactly your map, Martin, but uh, I've got a little graphy thing. But essentially, all the pitches I've been on can be summed up in this graph. They all follow the same rhythm, which is you start by saying, you've got a great brand. I love your brand. We love your brand. The thing is, though, your brand's in a bit of a pickle. What are we going to do about that? Well, there's good news. There's stuff going on in culture, in society. We're on the move. Society and culture are on the move. And you know what? We're going to help you hitch your wagon to that change. All great cells, most great cells, let's not say all, most great cells follow that rhythm. The second skill, and again it's been echoed throughout, is the skill of reduction. It's a curious thing about intelligent people, but we, we tend to exhibit our intelligence through making things complicated. And um, Nigel Bogle, who is an account man observing planners, uh, once observed, sometimes I think we dig as deep as Australia to discover the meaning of a paperclip. Uh, and, and you recognize that in yourself. Uh, and the great planners, as has been said, uh, reduce. They can reduce to aphorism, memorable sets of words that the client can take with them that summarize the direction that the agency is recommending. So Hagen Das, before many of you were born, <laughs> uh, had on the product pack dedicated to perfection a product claim. 
And we wanted to say that the brand needed an emotional hit. So we said, of course, you're dedicated to perfection, but your brand must be dedicated to pleasure. Now, that's a memorable transition for the client to understand. Back in the day with Lynx, we had to explain that Lynx was not a guarantee for success. It was your best first move. It had to have a moderation in itself. It was not a guarantee of success. And although those words seem modest now, they drove uh, all of that campaign that ran through the 90s because it was all about your best first move, not a guarantee. Um, I sat in a pitch once with John Bartle. These were the slightly more red-blooded days where you could say things like this. But it, it was an ITV pitch, and he said, um, most brands add value. Your brand subtracts value. <laughs> now, I don't think we won that pitch because obviously they felt <laughs> insulted. But um, it was truly memorable. Uh, <laughs> the third power of persuasion is visualization. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of science stuff about pictures. Um, and uh, when I was very young, my boss, uh, Charlie Robertson, was pitching for Shell Oil. And he developed this thing purely for the pitch, which was his strategic refinery. And as he went through the pitch, examining potential positionings, he put them through the refinery and worked out which ones came out. Now, it was purely, I guess, a piece of theater, but the clients really felt that somehow their brand, this pitch, had gone through the strategic refinery in order to get to uh, the only answer that was possible. Um, many years ago, when we pitched for Olivio, um, Olivio was all about some form of modern, healthy living. And, um, but, but I think we summed up what was going on in society with a simple picture. I mean, it's a pretty crude picture, isn't it? It's uh, no pain, no gain, I'll run it off. Healthy mind means healthy body. The three ages of engagement with food and health. But for the client, that three ages thing really stuck with them and that they could hitch a ride on the new and emergent holistic health phenomenon. It was a visualized thought, not just a verbalized one. Um, now, I'm slightly ashamed of the crudeness of some of these illustrations. Um, we pitched for KFC, um, and uh, uh, we'd done some research. And funnily enough, this piece of research really stuck with the client, because um, in the research, they'd done that sort of the old planet game, where you say, imagine a planet for this brand. And this was the planet McDonald's that came out of the research. And it was all full of color and vibrancy and was a bit sort of Disney-esque, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this was the planet uh, KFC. It was a sort of a lonely planet with just the kernel and the chicken and uh, et cetera. Now, obviously absurd and a bit facile, uh, but that stuck with the client in terms of what their, their task and their challenge was. Um, also, I'm, I'm slightly ashamed to say uh, the, the culmination of the KFC pitch was um, uh, we all had to do a yum cheer, which is a sort of a, a, a dance of a so give me a Y, give me a U, give me an M. Um, so maybe there's something about persuasion which is uh, indignity. Uh, <laughs> so we've touched on this, the power of theater. Um, We've probably all recreated a student bedroom in one of the office meeting rooms. Um, it can work for some clients, so you know, recreating a, uh, something. Uh, I think often um, demonstrations work, demonstrating in a slightly theatrical way. Um, again, this is ancient history, but there used to be a type of camera called a Polaroid. <laughs> and uh, a Polaroid was a crude piece of technology that uh, uh, took photos. I don't know how to describe it, but I think you know what it is anyway. Uh, and anyway, it was the summer, and the team, the pitch team, sent some people, to, and everyone was going to weddings, and they said, well, when you go to the wedding, can you, you get some people to take a Polaroid photo, and some people to take a 35 mil photo? And we didn't really know what was going to happen. But of course, when the photos came back, 
The 35 mil photos were because people think it's for posterity, so they posed, if you like. And the Polaroid, I suppose it's what a, a phone would do now, but the Polaroid photos were more spontaneous, more um, lived and expressive, etc., etc. So we were able to demonstrate to the client that their camera was fundamentally different from any other kind of camera because it brought this uh, spontaneity to it. Um, we, once, uh, we once pitched for milk. All the best pitches we lost, by the way, but um, <laughs> um, we once pitched for milk and we were quite struck by the fact that milk uh, is a beautiful, healthy, white liquid, very natural, and yet everyone disregards it and thinks it's uninteresting. Uh, and, and the proposal that we came up with was, why don't we rebrand milk as something else? So we called it Kimmel. And we took Kimmel out to a couple of shopping centers up and down the country and filmed people's response to the new drink, Kimmel. And we showed people what Kimmel had in it, sort of calcium and great vitamins and all that kind of thing, and showed them this beautiful white drink and they were in awe of it. And so we have this, again, a piece of theater to dramatize the point that you want to make. So finally, um, I do agree with the points that has been made about optimism, but I think it's interesting to introduce a note of melancholy into persuasion. <clears throat> I was once trying to um, persuade a Levi's client to buy a print campaign. And uh, we were in reception. And the client was sensitive, bit iffy, uncomfortable with the whole thing. And um, I said to the client, well, you know, the client said, it's risky. And I, and I said, well, it's a risk worth taking. It's a risk worth taking. I think it's going to be great. And um, at that moment, John Hegarty walked through the reception. And I stopped him because I thought, this is perfect. I can just get John to complete the cell. And I said, um, I said um, John, John, Roy here thinks that... The the new opinion leader print campaign is a bit risky. What do you think? And John said, uh, that's right, it might even be a mistake. <laughs> now, uh, why do I think that's interesting? I think it's interesting to have a mature debate with your clients that calibrates risk. You cannot promise that there is no risk. You must engage with them and have a serious conversation about the pros and cons of what might happen. And also, I would say that negativity can be quite a handy tool in persuasion, because occasionally you work out that uh, when you're stuck and in a bit of a pickle, it's worth denying the brand's existence. So, so I'll make some clarity. Yeah. Sometimes it's worth asking, what if it didn't exist? What if the category didn't exist? What if the name of the category didn't exist? And that can be very helpful because it forces you to think of alternative ways of selling, alternative ways of articulating the category. So with Polaroid, back to Polaroid again, um, we found that we could say in the pitch, Polaroid is not a camera. Because actually, if you regarded it as a camera, it wasn't a very good camera. Polaroid is a social lubricant, we said, so it's closer to beer or uh, that sort of category of things, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a very good film noir, which I will commend to you. And um, if I can remember what it's called, um, <laughs> with um, Robert Mitchum, Out of the Past, exactly. Rob, Robert Mitchum and Jane Greer in Out of the Past. And um, Robert Mitchum keeps coming back to the femme fatale, Jane Greer. And, um, and he says, um, and she, she cannot be trusted at all. But she says to him one last time, I didn't take anything. I didn't, Jeff. Don't you believe me? And he said, baby, I don't care. And um, this is a slightly philosophical note. But sometimes I think the industry cares too much. And caring can turn into a service business into being servile. So you need to be prepared occasionally to walk away. So five powers of persuasion. There they are. And can I do one last story? I can't remember where I am. I can. One last story. Uh, don't let persuasion turn to deception. Uh, 
This was a film we made back in the 90s for um, uh, Levi's. And um, the, the film involved, I won't show the film. The film involved, it's an old gag. A young lad goes to a drugstore, buys a condom, drives through the night to pick up his girlfriend. The dad opens the door and the dad turns out to have been the druggist, etc., etc. We always used to say Levi's gags were just Benny Hill gags, uh, but done in a stylish, filmic way. And um, anyway, the, cre the critical thing that the client was concerned about was, um, um, will people get it? Will they get that that guy, visually, is the same as that guy? And we did the research, and the research said people got it. But he still didn't really, he, didn't, he hadn't seen it, so he didn't believe it. Now, the research dude at Levi's thought, well, I think we can organize a bit of a test here. And uh, he, he showed it in front of his boss to an Aussie guy who worked in the department but didn't know anything about the film or the work, etc. And he showed it to him, and the bloke described it perfectly. He says, yeah, Martin, it's a uh, guy, goes to a drugstore, buys a condom, drives through the night, goes, knocks on the door, Bloke opens the door, Struth. It's the bloke, it's the bloke that's got the drugstore. That is the dad. And we were also going, oh, excellent, excellent. And, uh, and then the vote said, uh, yeah, it's exactly like you told me, Martin. <laughs> so, um, so we got into a bit of trouble about that. Um, and so the lesson is, uh, the final lesson of persuasion is uh, don't cheat. There we go.